Number well, one today is Thursday, June 27, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Looks like you guys are beginning to find the show again. That's fantastic. I'm trying to make it easier and easier to find, and I'll start making sure I put up banner ads and such for that. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I don't have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind with the questions, keep them relative to the slides, just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And then when we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. And when we do get to the live charts, also hold off on your stock picks until we do, obviously. And that's just to keep me from not overlooking your questions or your stock pick. Also. If you would put in just one ticker at a time and hit return, that would be awesome, too. And that's for your benefit, just to make sure I get all of the tickers covered. So what are we talking about? Well, I woke up this morning thinking I really wanted to get into delivered practice because that's something that I just sort of repurposed on the website and the importance of that. And in the meantime, I ended up finding a presentation that I did a few years back on failing to win. And I thought it was pretty relevant given the current conditions and all. And the importance of accepting risk as a trader. And we all obviously have ups and downs. And we're going to get into all that in just one second. Before we do all that, let's just take a look at the disclaimer screen. I put part question of question mark that was left over. Simply because I think this is a topic that could become bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've expanded upon the presentation that I did a couple of years ago. And you'll see that today. Anyway, before we do all that, disclaimer screens, disclaimer screens, disclaimer screens. And the best way to sum it up, barring a line from my friend Greg Morris, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about failing to win, becoming a successful trader by accepting risk. Now, trading involves risk, and there's a big duh implied. And anytime I talk about something simple like this, your eyes glaze over and you're like, okay, Dave, we get it. But you'd be surprised at how many people don't get it. You'd be surprised at how many people aren't willing to accept the risk of a trade. And that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. And believe me, I'm far from perfect. I cuss and I fuss and I get quite angry. And I'm sure that'll come up in this presentation. So before we get started on that, let's just take a look at what risk is. According to Merriam Webster, it's the possibility of loss or injury, peril. So risk, by definition, means potential to fail. There's been quite a few great failures throughout history. Babe Ruth, who struck out 13, 30 times, held the home run record for 30 years. And I'm not a huge baseball fan, but just for S and Gs, I Googled strikeouts from batters, and the list reads like a who's who of baseball. And even I recognize some of the names, such as A-Rod, Sammy Sosa, and many others. Sir James Dyson failed 5,127 times to perfect the vacuum cleaner. And he's worth between four and five billion, by the way. Billion here, billion there. After a while, it begins to add up a little bit. And of course, Edison failed 10,000 times trying to perfect the light bulb. Edison did not create the light bulb, but he worked to make it better. Now, if you haven't read Oh, the Places You Will Go by Dr. Seuss, I would strongly urge you to read it. I was given the book when I went full time with my trading efforts. I never heard of the book, but it could just as easily be written for a trader as it could be for anyone else who is moving on in life, graduating or whatever the other case may be, changing jobs, et cetera, starting a business. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true, bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. 
and in the markets they will happen to you. So how do you completely avoid failure? Well, never attempt anything. Am I right? With a W. Quoting Stephen Wright, Eagles may soar, but weasels don't get sucked into jet engines. Getting back to Babe Ruth, one of his famous quotes is, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. And as Edison said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Now, when you talk about risk or when you look at risk as it applies to trading, there's two types of risk. The first and the most obvious is monetary risk. The other risk, which we're going to focus on today, is the psychological risk. And that's the tough part. That's the hard part of trading. It's probably the hardest part of trading is the psychological risk when it comes to losing money or concerned about losing money. Now, as I've said before, a few years back, I spoke at a conference and Dr. Robert Marr was also speaking at the conference and he's a psychologist. He's not a trading psychologist, but a lot of the psychology that he talks about and has written about dovetails in nicely with trading. And I immediately bought his books after listening to him speak. And he poises the question, is rejection painful? And he gives a scenario where a young man asks a young lady out on Saturday night to go out on Saturday night. And she says, oh, I'm sorry, I floss on Saturday nights. Now, there's two different reactions to that. One guy would just kind of say, oh, well, whatever, and go ask somebody else. <laughs> Which kind of reminds me in college, it's like if I, if I got rejected, I would get so bummed out. And then I had friends that get rejected and they're like, eh, they just like, okay, what about you? <laughs> and they always had dates. Anyway, so that rejection is all in your mind. And that if you get rejected and you're like, oh, I'm worthless and all this other self-fulfilling prophecies begin to show up, then that's what's going to manifest. And that's a lot of what Dr. Robert Marr was talking about, which got me thinking about, okay, is there really fear in the markets? Well, there's nothing to fear in the markets, and I'm gonna prove that. So the question is, how stressful was the 2016, 2017 bear market in cocoa? And I've asked this question a few times, and not once, has someone said that it stressed them out? Now, I'm sure somebody actually took a trade in Coco, tried to go long during his bear market and regretted it. But so far, I haven't found anyone. And so far, no one's been stressed out about the bear market in Coco. So here's a market that exists, that's out there, that you likely had no idea was in one of the worst bear markets in history, and it created absolutely no stress to you. So I think that that's exhibit A, that there is no fear in the markets. That fear is within. So a market cannot create pain or fear. Let me say that again. A market cannot create pain or fear. That is created from within. Now, with any decision comes emotions. That's biology. You know, got to be careful as I was doing a little rehearsing a few minutes ago. I found myself going on and on and on about the decision thing. And that's something that I've really beat the dead horse on quite a bit, is that you can't make any decisions without emotions. You can't be like Spock. You can't eliminate emotions from your decisions. Otherwise, you'd be dead in a week. With every decision comes emotions. So that's biology or neurology, if you want to look at it like that. But if there's fear, then we haven't fully accepted the consequences of our decision. Or 
there's something we need to know to make better decisions in the first place. Now, channeling the late, great Mark Douglas, what you fear is not the markets. That's my whole point here. But rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. Time and time again, as one person probably thinks I'm going to pick on him right now, but it's, it's not you. It's the yous like you throughout my career that I've encountered. You're gung-ho getting into a position, and in this particular case, this was one very profitable trade, in one particular case I'm thinking about, but it turned into a big loser. And there was no fear going in, there was no fear as long as it was going up, but when it began to implode, they became the deer in the headlights. Now, I'm hinting that it's one particular example, but there's been a lot of these things that have happened over the years that I've seen. So. What you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. So along the lines of avoiding the fear, you don't need to fear the market. You do need to trust yourself. You must acquire the mindset that you will always act in your own best interest. And you will always maintain an objective state of mind. One of the things I've been working on a little bit lately, based on the Scott Adams book, How to Fail at Most Everything and Still Succeed, I think that's the title of it. It's in my last now column, and I'll probably put, up, put out another now column soon, or I should say, in case somebody's watching a recording of this, this, this was in the now column for May 31st, 2019. Anyway, he talks a lot about affirmations, and one thing that I was thinking about doing is taking that ball and running with it. And yeah, we all have these grandiose affirmations. We want to have so many million dollars in so many years, but we also need to have some smaller affirmations to get us there. I will pick the best and leave the rest. I will plan my trade. I will follow my plan. If you do those little micro affirmations, that's going to save you from, and here's a big word, acrasia, which is the doing anything other than what you're supposed to do. So I think that's something that I'm going to flesh out over time, and it's vitally important. And you know, there's actually some neurology involved when it comes to affirmation. So if you work to become a better stock picker, if you work to become a better process-oriented person. In other words, learn to follow the process. The process is plan the trade. The process is follow the plan. Then you're going to reach a point where you're going to trust yourself and there will be nothing to fear. Well, I'm not sure it's going to be that great because you're still going to have some fears. And that's one thing I like to point out is that I still drop a lot of F-bombs. I still get pretty upset. I dropped a few last week. I may have dropped one this morning. But as a general statement, the more you trust in yourself, the less fear there will be. Now, of course, there will be blood. You will have losing trades, and that's life. <laughs> it's funny. I remember years ago, I left this in, but years ago, I was consulting with a hedge fund and on Monday mornings we would kind of chatted up a little bit before we get to the markets he's like I saw a movie over the weekend it was horrible I'm like he's like it, it was horrible I can't even remember the name it was horrible though <laughs> and I'm like there will be blood he's like yes <laughs> so there will be blood now you have to plan for failure but that's not saying that you plan to fail you just have to plan for failure because it spelled with a silent SH, happens. Now, one way to do that, and this is a reoccurring theme that I've talked about over and over again, and I've seen a lot of other people in more recent times talking about it. In fact, we'll get to that in just one second. But you have to accept the loss going into a trade. So if you're risking 2% of your account, and let's say you have a $100,000 account, well, that's $2,000. So going into that trade, you have to say, well, I could possibly lose two thousand dollars 
on this trade. And you have to wrap your head around that. And as I often say, you have to view it as a cost of doing business. So look at the trade as a cost, just like a business person would look at the cost of buying inventory or whatever the case may be, supplies, etc. You have to embrace that potential loss. Now, you don't want to obviously hope that you get the loss. I mean, that's you wouldn't want to do that, obviously. But you have to embrace the potential that you could have a losing trade. You have to treat your stocks as employees and not your little children. You can't, and I'm borrowing a line from someone, I don't know, I don't remember who said it, but they said you can't prattle your stocks. If you ran a business and you had five employees and one guy sat on his butt all day and hasn't done a damn thing in weeks and the other four were working their butt off, you wouldn't fire the four that are working their butt off but keep the one that's not doing anything because he's due to do something someday right you would get rid of them so you have to treat your stocks as your little employees and when they're not performing you have to say you're fired now your children obviously a little bit different you have to give them plenty of chances and you can't really give up on them right so stocks are not your little children they serve a purpose and when their purpose is done you have to get rid of them as I often say, when I get stopped out, I channel Paul Giamatti as John Adams. I say good day, sir. <laughs> now, getting rid of the bad often, I guess I should say often, leaves the good. Now, every stock in my portfolio is now profitable. And no, I'm not the grand poobah. I noticed that yesterday. It actually scares me a little bit. Every stock I own right now, and I should preface that, in my main big portfolio is profitable. I'm like, wow, look at that. Everyone's profitable. And you're thinking, oh, well, Dave thinks he's the grand poobah. No, no, no. The reason I'm telling you that is the way I got that portfolio profitable was I kept the winners. And I sold the losers. Now, when I say sell the losers, you have to hold on to a loser until you're stopped out. You have to follow the plan. Okay. It's not like you just come in and say, well, let me just sell whatever's losing today. That's not how it works. That's not how any of it works. As I preach quite often, markets will back and fill a lot. In fact, as Greg Morris says, markets only make new highs about 4% of the time. So 96% of the time they're backing and filling. Now, he's talking about the indices, but you get the point. If the overall market is only making new highs 4% of the time or 97 or the other flip side of that is 96% of the time it's backing and filling, then your positions will likely do the same. So I'm not saying get rid of every lose in your portfolio, but if you're stopped out and you know you're wrong as a trend follower and you know you're wrong when you're wrong, okay, then you need to get out. Now, a few years back, my in-laws visited for dinner, and they always tend to <laughs> they always tend to visit when I've given up drinking for a while, and then they uh, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Anyway, we always get into heated arguments on whatever for whatever reason. I'm trying to learn just to let it go, let it go. There's a singing, <laughs> but we were talking about investments and such, and I told him that at this particular point in time, gold looked like a good investment, or more specifically a trade, but he doesn't understand trading. I just thought it'd be a good time for him to buy a little gold. And he's like, why would they sell it to you? And I'm like, excuse me? He goes, why would they sell it to you? Why do these people on TV sell it to you? And I'm like, well, that's a good point, you know? If it's such a good investment, why are there all of these trying to sell you gold on TV. Now, of course, there's a huge markup and they're making money on the markup, but he brings a very interesting point. If gold is so great and going higher, why would anyone sell it? So this got me thinking to circle back to whenever I place a trade, 
I always wonder, why is someone selling me that stock? Now, when I trade, I buy at one level and I sell at a level hopefully higher for my long positions. So let's say I buy a stock here and then I hope, I know I said hope, but I hope, why did I buy the stock here? Okay, well, I had a setup and I wanted to make money and blah, blah, blah. But my hope is that I could sell it somewhere here for maybe half profits and then possibly trail a stop higher for a long, long time and then eventually get stopped out way up here somewhere, okay? Kind of like Bitcoin right now. Maybe I'll get stopped out at 10,000 or maybe I get stopped out at 100,000, okay? But I'm taking half off and then I'm just riding the trend. Well, selling higher than you buy is known as the greater fool theory. The only reason to ever buy a stock or Bitcoin or any other market is that you believe in the greater fool theory. So before going into the trade, ask yourself, why would they sell it to you? Okay. When you go to buy something, someone sells it to you. They want out. So you have to ask yourself, Am I the greater fool going into the trade? Now, this is kind of humbling and a little bit on the negative side, but you get the idea. So whenever I go into the trade, I ask myself, am I the greater fool? What does the person on the other side of the trade know that I don't know? We can't both be right. So always ask yourself, are you the greater fool? And why would they sell it to you? A few weeks back, I was, I'd normally host, or when I appear, I usually host the Timing Research show. And I was asked to be on as a guest, which was a lot less stressful. It's kind of nice. Anyway, Jake Bernstein was on, and he had this unbelievable quote that I just keep coming back to. And I asked Jake where he he got it, or the original source, and he said it was from Larry Williams. To make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you're clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. I think you repeat that. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. I have some little S and G type accounts out there, and I'll throw a little trade on, take profits where I should, let it ride on the remainder, and I can care less. And you know what? I do pretty good. And that's why you see all these claim to fame people. They run a small account up to a fairly sizable amount. But the Janet Jackson rest of the story there is, what have you done for me lately? So it's pretty easy to run a small account up. I'm not saying it's that easy, but from a following the plan standpoint or don't care or being clinically dispassionate, you could do it. But when that account gets a little bit bigger and you begin to mentally monetize the moves, geez, I just lost a mortgage payment or a car payoff or whatever. I could have bought a boat with the loss on that trade. It becomes a little bit harder. So it's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. I'm going to have to get a banner with that made. Now, getting back to the going into a trade, you have to ask yourself, where would you be wrong as a trend follower? And the other management things too, such as Where's the noise of the market and make sure I'm outside of that noise. But a very important thing to ask yourself is where would you be wrong as a trend follower? Now, the easiest way to show you this, and this is one reason I like the transitional setups, or in other words, these early trend or emerging trend setups, these new trend setups, because if the market goes down to make new lows, you know that you are wrong. So let's say you get in this market thinking that you have the mother of all bottoms. 
and then that stock or other market begins to drop and goes on to make new lows. <laughs> yeah, that that is laughing because it's trumping here. I actually have a Make America Great hat that's printed in Russian, and I love the. I, that's my favorite hat. I wear it everywhere. I don't even know who it offends, but I just think it's funny as hell. But I could care less too. I often forget I'm wearing it, and people are like, "What does that say?" My daughter had a friend from Russia who came over the other day, and she confirmed that it's it's uh, correct. Yeah, if you look on my personal Facebook page, there's a picture of me with the hat on with a big grin from year to year. So it's very important to accept the risk when it comes to trading. You have to, again, accept that risk going in. Now, this is the reoccurring theme. I'm long XYZ. It's dropping like a stone. What should I do? Well, it's cliche, but of course, plan your trade, trade your plan. The old me used to be like, well, it'll be okay. Maybe next time, and now, then, and I realized that after 20 something years of doing that, I've done a huge disservice to people. Not that I want people to be pissed off at me, but I want you to get a little angry at that loss that you should have taken. Get a little angry because you didn't plan your trade and trade your plan. So the new Dave, because the tough, the, because the easy going prattling or whatever the word is of the clients and fans and people who are contacting me because they're freaking out just didn't work the new me is like okay well here's a little tough love you learned a lesson get over it from now on you're going to plan ahead of time don't take a trade unless you have a plan for where you could be wrong now as i often say Money management will cure a multitude of sins. The better you can follow your money management, the better you will be from a psychological perspective. The ultimate goal in life is to be happy. I think we lose sight of that sometimes, and that's a whole presentation that might even be outside of trading. Why are we trading? Well, we want to make money, and we assume that that money is going to help make us a little bit happier. You know, who's a comedian once said? Money can't buy happiness, but I've never seen somebody depressed on a jet ski, you know? <laughs> but money management will cure a multitude of sins. If you only lose a maximum of 2%, barring overnight gaps on a trade, then it's really not going to ruin your lifestyle. Yeah, you might get bummed out or pissed off or drop an F-bomb, but after a while and after you've had enough of these, you drop the F-bomb and then you shout, next. So money management will cure a multitude of sins. It'll keep you from trading at a size that's too big. It'll force you to take profits while everybody else is all excited about a market that's going parabolic. What's the old Linda Rasky saying? Feed the ducks while they're quacking. It will force you to feed the ducks while they're quacking. You'll take those partial profits as that market begins to go parabolic or whatever the case may be when it's hitting your initial profit target that is, your plan, your money management plan, and then you'll trail that stop on those open profits on the remainder. And if it does continue to go parabolic, hopefully, and I know I said hope, but hopefully you'll be in that market for a long, long time. You'll know what to do. And you'll have, and this is the ultimate goal in every position, is you'll have a free position. I get stressed out, admittedly, once I put a position on, I am stressed out until and unless it hits the initial profit target. And then I begin to breathe a little easier. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I've, I just have a half a position on now. The worst could happen, barring overnight gaps, is that I scratch out. And then after that position's been on for a while and I've taken those partial profits and I'm trailed that stop, then it's like, well, I might give up some open profits. And I'm not going to be happy about that. Don't get me wrong. But at least I know if I stop out of this quote unquote free position, then I'm going to be okay. And my account on a net net basis is going to be higher than what it was before I put on the position. So I'm kind of beating a dead horse here on money management. And the point is that money management will cure a multitude of sins. But it's also important to take a step back and 
remember that it helps not to lose in the first place. Now, somebody in trading once said, in order to win, you must first not lose. Well, it's impossible not to lose, but it is possible to lose less. So a good defense, in other words, money management, is crucial, but never forget that a good offense is your best defense. Now, it's cliche, but pick the best and leave the rest. And it was Sakota, I believe, and Market Wizards that said you have to be careful to separate intuition from into wishing. And I've quoted him so much, people start to quote me on that. It's kind of like a lot of the Linda Rasky quotes that I used to quote. People like, oh, Dave Landry says, it's like, no, I didn't say that. Linda said it, or Ed Sakota said it. So very important to get better at getting better. That said, deliberate practice reared its ugly head again. And so how do you do that? Well, you have to work at it, unfortunately. And I put up an article on Facebook on deliberate practice, a link back to the website or whatever. And somebody's like, oh, you're such a great master, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, wait a minute. Read the article. I didn't say that trading was easy. I said you had to work at it. And the 10,000 hour rule is pretty true. Provided, of course, you're working hard to get better. If you see a stock take off, ask yourself, could I have caught this move? Should I have caught this move? And that's where a lot of my patterns come from. And a lot of my getting better at picking stocks comes from, and a lot of my actually taking the trades that I find comes from. And just kind of an example, in the more recent years, the IPO stuff, I noticed that these IPOs, they either fail or do fairly well after the first week of trading. More often than not, many of them fail in the first week. I did some IPO presentations recently. And I showed failure after failure after failure for the first week. And my whole point was you're just avoiding these crappy trades. And some people took it that I was trying to explain that IPOs fail. Well, a lot of them do fail, but a lot of them do quite well. So I figured, okay, well, we know they fail in the first week. That's something that a little bit of empirical research, in other words, looking at a few thousand of these helped me to figure out. But what happens after that first week if they begin to break out? And that's how I came up with these simple little breakout patterns like, okay, well, how could I show you to stay out for one week? Well, five-day moving average, because you won't have a moving average until day five or day six, depending on what charting package you're using. I guess technically you could have one on day five. And then say, well, the low has to be greater than moving average. That means you have momentum, and the close has to be at a new closing high. That's an entire setup in and of itself. But I'll show you a stock in a few minutes that's uh, current long in my portfolio based on that setup. We were talking about the Facebook group. So as I often say, garbage in, garbage out. I learned that very early in my computer science days back in college. If you write crappy code, the computer's gonna give you crappy output. So along the lines of trading, learn to pick the best and leave the rest. And it's hard because you reach a point, for instance, like right now, where I wanna make as much money as fast as possible, as does everyone else. I'm also building a house, okay? And it's like every time I turn around, pfft, big old expense, you know, pfft, another thousand for this. Pfft, you know, it's ridiculous. And I'm trying to make up those expenses as fast as I can. But sometimes, as I preach, it takes a lot of patience. And that's where that, again, beat the dead horse on Sakota from Market Wizards, garb, um, intuition versus intuition. So very hard for me personally to pick the best to leave the rest right now because I'm really looking for that next big winner. I need that next big winner. We all do. But if you're following along on the service, and this is why I have an educational business, or one of the reasons I should say, I got into this business by accident, the educational side that is. But anyway, the service forces me to look for the best opportunities because I know people are watching and depending on me and paying a lot of money, but it also forces me to not do anything when there's nothing to do. And that could be the hard part. So Papa John, as I often say, would probably make a pretty good trader. Better ingredients, better pizza. Now remember that a loss 
is not always a failure. Just because you didn't win on a trade doesn't mean you did something wrong. Remember, you have to be process oriented and that outcome bias thing comes to mind. I talk a lot about outcome biases and then a few years after me beating a dead horse on outcome biases, Annie Duke came out with a book called Thinking in Bets. I'd recommend you read it. She didn't really give you a huge solution to the problem, but she did suggest things that I suggest, like hold yourself accountable to the process. And possibly one of the things you could do is maybe find a trading partner. And that sounds kind of tough, but if you're in a Facebook group and we're bouncing ideas back and forth, you can kind of get a feel for doing the right thing there. And you can see what other people are doing. And that will help out tremendously, especially if you're willing to admit your mistakes and hold yourself accountable. Now, in Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader, that's a book I would also recommend you read. I gave away my copy, and then I went to buy a new one and found out it was a rare book. <laughs> so if you can find a cheap copy, let me know. But a guy by the name of Longstreet wrote this. And years and years ago, I think it was Traders Press. There was two of them, Traders Press and one other company. I forget the other one, but I'm pretty sure it was Traders Press. And my goal was to read every single book from them. And I would order book after book after book. And that was just one of the books that they had. And that's how I found it. And it's a really good book. It's very short read. Just a few little thoughts on each page. But one of the things that Longstreet said was sometimes a market can make a mistake. Now, as I beat the dead horse on, the post-mortem will reveal whether or not you have picked the best and left the rest. You have to back up your chart to the day before you took the trade, and you have to ask yourself, did that stock trade cleanly? Was there acceleration? Was there persistency? Was that knockout move really a big enough knockout move for something like a trend knockout? Or if you're trading something like an emerging trend, was it a nice, clean, tight bow tie? Is it coming off of major, major, major lows, multi-year lows, maybe 10-year lows or something? And if it's a first thrust or whatever, was it a significant thrust from lows? And so on and so forth. Now, as I often say, especially early in the process, I used to look at these trades and go, what the hell was I thinking? And the true enlightenment comes when you find yourself doing that less and less. I still do that to some extent, but not nearly as much as I used to. So that's when you know you're becoming enlightened is when you ask yourself that less. Now, the other thing is, obviously, you need to learn from your failures. Was there something to be learned? Well, there's not always something to be learned because sometimes, as Longstreet said, the market can make a mistake. Sometimes things happen. I mean, who knows? I mean, some maybe there was something unforeseen. A big trader comes in and dumps a bunch that's been sitting on it for a long time, was just waiting for that rally to happen to get out, to get off the hook. Who knows? So there won't always be something to learn, but a lot of times there will be. So I just got creamed recently on a really thin IPO. Was it too thin to trade? I don't know, probably. <laughs> you know, I'll have to go back in and do the postmortem. I've kind of held off on that because I'm still angry. See, do as I say, not as I do, right? Now, channeling Churchill, success is going from one failure to another without any loss in enthusiasm. And that's why I shout next and I say good day, sir, on a losing trade. Now, I don't want this to imply that you should just go out, lose money, lose money, lose money, lose money, lose money. You should go out, and if you lose money, do the postmortem, make sure you pick the best and leave the rest, and then going into the next trade, make sure you pick the best and leave the rest, and rinse and repeat until you get better at that, picking the best and leaving the rest, until it's no longer garbage in, garbage out. Now, getting back to Mark Douglas, one of the favorite things that he said was comparing good traders versus bad traders to good salesmen versus bad salesmen. A 
good salesman will get rejected three, four, or maybe more times in a row. And then he'll go get a cup of coffee. And then he'll come back jazz, knowing that he's getting closer and closer to the winning sale, to the big sale. Whereas a bad salesman will get rejected three or four or more times in a row. And then he'll go off to drink his lunch. So provided you're following a viable, conceptually correct, and I know I'm biased, I think the only way to make money is trend following. Well, I know the only way to make money is to capture a trend, so why not be a trend follower? But if you're conceptually correct and picking the best and leaving the rest and all those other cliches and planning your trade, follow your plan, blah, 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 and you get knocked out of a few trades, you know you're getting closer and closer and closer to some winning trades. Now, to end it all, let's talk about Livermore, who, by the way, did end it all. So <laughs> maybe we won't end up like Livermore, but before he decided to end it all, he did give us a lot of wisdom. If a man didn't make a mistake, he'd own the world in a month. But if he didn't profit by his mistakes, he wouldn't own a blessed thing. So learn from your mistakes. Use the liver practice to get better so you make fewer mistakes and then have that money management as your airbag for when, not if, bad things happen. Okay, so that bastard John Snow has been talking about winter is coming. I think winter finally came. This market has become lately more disappointing than the last episode of Game of Thrones. So the question now is, is winter still coming. We just made brand new highs in the S&P 500. Although I'm beginning to wonder, is this a Janet Jackson market? What have you done for me lately? So one thing I was thinking about this morning is it's important to balance being skeptical through extensive empirical research. In other words, looking at a S ton of charts, a bunch of charts, as you young kids say now, S ton. That's become part of my vocabulary now. So I'm a little skeptical right now, and that's because I'm looking at a lot of charts and I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups. And I'm seeing a lot of sectors of the questionable. So you have to balance that with being a trend following moron. And I remember recently when I was really bearish. And somebody in the Facebook group pointed out that we had a buy signal in the TFM 10% system. I'm like, no, 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 you can't have a buy. You have to be within 10% of the highs, blah, 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 the closing high. And lo and behold, we had a buy signal, okay? So as long as the market is at or near new highs, you have to give it the benefit of the doubt. However, you still need to, I think, be a little skeptical and make sure you look under the hood a little bit. And again, it's a bit of a balancing act, going back from being back and forth from being skeptical and, and noticing the negatives of the market, the internals, the sector action, the lack of setups, et cetera, to the fact of what is, is. Is the market making new highs? Well, let's give it a bit of a doubt. But right now, even though we have like some signals that are long, not new buy signals, but existing buy signals, Go in and watch last week's presentation. We talked about new versus existing signals. The market, the indices are stalling a little bit. Some sectors are dubious at best. I've been bearish in the semiconductors, although they've been coming back as of late. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. Transports look a little dubious in here. Internet and quite a few others. And some of the sectors that have broken out recently, like retail, kind of looked like the S&P 500 broke out and then came right back in. So far, no follow through. And then as I've been preaching a rusty 2000, doesn't look so good. And we'll talk about that in just one second. And again, there's been a drought of setups. I need to pay for a refrigerator. So I need $8,000 or whatever ridiculous amount of money a fridge costs nowadays, okay? So I'm looking for a little IPO or something where I can go in, make a little money, and then write a check for the fridge. I don't want to. 
I don't want to finance anything. I just want to pay cash for it all, and I want to make that money in the market. So I've got to be careful. Again, boy, here comes a dead horse being beat, huh? I said horse. Uh, my brother-in-law makes fun of me because I say harsh instead of horse. But there's been a drought of setups, and I'm trying to make something happen. So this next little IPO that I see, is it intuition or intuition? There could be one that sets up on the close today, the one we're talking about in the Facebook group. I'm going to tease you, but if you're in the group, you'll know what it is. I need to double check that to make sure there's plenty of volume, make sure the spread's not too big, make sure it's got a nice range, make sure it fits all the criteria for setup, and then decide whether or not I'm going to go with it. If it does, then I'm going to go with it. But I can't jump in just because I need the money. So again, you have to weigh all this with the fact that the market is not too far away from all-time highs. So it's kind of like, do you give it the benefit of the doubt? Now, Dathan had asked at the beginning of the presentation, before we get to the stock picks, which we're getting ready to do now, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. I'm going to go through a few things in the overall market, some of the things I just kind of hinted at, and then we'll open it up for stock questions. But if you want to put them in so we have a few to look at, feel free to get started now. So before we get to the stock picks, can you give your thoughts on all the profit-taking last few days? Is it a normal pullback activity or signs of a transition? Thanks. Well, here's the first thing that I'm thinking about. You never know if uh, profit taking is a dumb thing, okay? So I would not use that term or I think it's I think it's kind of a dumb media term. And it's kind of like the media tends to like to be bullish and a lot of the people the media has on are always bullish and they don't they don't want to say that the market went down because there was supply because that's why a market goes down because there was supply i guess the business channel would be quite boring if every day they said the market went up because it was demand. The market went down because it was supply. That's really all they would ever have to say. So I think that is a silly term, and there's no way of knowing whether or not it truly is profit-taking or if it's just bona fide selling. So I would erase that term from your head or certainly – don't try to figure that out because there's no way you'll ever know. But it is a cute little thing to say. And you only know after you know, okay? Now, it's not the end of the world. We only had a few little down days in here. But it is a little disappointing that we were off to the races just last week. And then we've already come back in below the prior peaks. So that's the bit of the bummer that I was talking about. Now, as I said a second ago, you have to weigh that with or against your 1% of change away from new highs. Well, the market could go 1% of change in one day. So the TFM 10% system, which is, I guess, 100% mechanical, I'm not going to think about it. I don't use it on a mechanical basis, but it's kind of interesting. If you were to look just at that system, which gives you a 100% objective view of the market, then it tells you that as long as you're at or near C, C being all-time highs, or in the case of the system, 50-week highs, which right now are the same thing because all-time highs were just a few days ago, then you stay long. And I think it does have some longer-term merit. It, it looks like it tests out fairly well. And more importantly than what it makes is what it doesn't lose. It'll get you out of the market before the market implodes. Yes, sometimes you will get a little whipsaw. It'll knock you out, and then it'll get you back in at a higher level, but that's okay. As I preach, like death and taxes, whipsaws are unavoidable. So anyway, so you bump it up against these prior peaks in here. You know me. I sure would like to see us break out and not look back for a while. Hey, 
Hey Dave, this week market might be the end of month, quarter, rebalancing by hedges, mutual funds, as we might be back to business as usual next week. Um, that's possible. I mean, you never know. I mean, it's always, it's always a reason. And I, and I hear you, Mike, and maybe that's what the reason is. But you have to always come back to what is, is. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? Or is the market going sideways? But yes, as soon as we get June behind us, maybe that's the all clear. I'll let you know in July. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ's having an okay day today. But as you can see, obviously, it did stall short of its prior highs in here. And so far, it's come back in. So that's a little bit problematic. Again, not the end of the world. Let's do a little quick measurement. Let's see where we are. So we're yeah, two or three quarter percent round numbers away from banging out all time highs. So, so far, it's okay. Rusty up nearly 1% today. But if you back the chart out to a weekly, as I've been saying, ad nauseum, so far, it just looks like a big picture retrace in here. And so far, it still looks like a major top. So this is one of the things that has me very concerned. As I often say, there's always something to worry about, right? Let's take a look at the semis. The semis appear to be kind of melting up in here, although they have tailed off their best levels. I wouldn't rush out and buy semiconductors just yet. If you look at the weekly chart, it looks a little uglier. I haven't done this. Let's do it on the fly. Let's take a look at the weekly bow ties. Yeah, no, not too much. They're turned back up. The reason the weekly bow ties turn back up, at least the exponentials, here's a good little teachable moment. Notice that this is a 10-day simple moving average. Which way is it headed? Down, very good. This is a 20-day exponential moving average. Which way is it headed? Which way is it headed? Up. And here's a 30. Which way is it headed? Up. Why are these headed up when they're longer term moving averages, but this one's headed down? Well, because with an exponential moving average, and think I thank Greg Morris for teaching me this, the day it crosses above that moving average, the price crosses above and closes above, obviously, is the same day it'll turn up. So you can see these moving averages are quickly going to catch up with price should we keep going higher. But for now, I wouldn't get too excited about the semiconductors. I still think they're in trouble. I still think this is a retrace rally. If you come in tomorrow and they're up another couple of percent on the open or whatever, maybe even a percent and a half, I would consider a day trade as an opening gap reversal. A lot of people like to look at the transports, or a lot of old timers do. And I think the transports are still in trouble in here, but obviously they're having a good day today. At the least they're wide and loose, but so far it looks like a thrust followed by a retrace in here. So as you go through the sectors, you'll find that a lot of mixed action throughout. Some like retail look like the overall market. They've recently broken out and have come back in. So not the end of the world because they're still what? Not too far from all time highs. So it's going to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but give the market the benefit of the doubt, but be skeptical. And as I said earlier, I'm not seeing many setups, and maybe that's just a function of the fact that I need a little bit more pullback in individual issues, but I'm very cautious. Now, if I start seeing a plethora of setups, very rarely do I see a plethora of setups and the market is not doing well. So that's kind of the flip side of that. So anyway, sector actually kind of remains mixed without going through too many of them. Energies have recently gotten a little pop in here, but they're kind of all over the place. It's kind of hard for me to get excited about them. Metals and mining are kind of all over the place. Recently, they've sort of melted up, no pun intended. But because of this wide and loose and all over the place action, I'm just really not seeing any setups that fit the methodology. I'd much rather come in something like the metals or anything commodity related when they're coming off of major lows like they were, let's say, back in 2016. Okay, so the point is mixed action throughout the sectors. Some sectors, software, doing pretty good, just kind of pulling back in here. But we do have to pay attention 
to see that if they come back to see if they come back below where they broke out. So let's say software was off at a races a few days ago, and now it's back below that little breakout level. Not the end of the world. Why? Well, we are, if my computer will work here, we are what? Just 2% and change away from all time highs. But again, you have to sometimes be a little skeptical and take a show me approach. I am mostly long in my portfolio. Well, actually, I'm 100% long now. I think I had some puts that stopped out last week, and I'm mostly long. Well, Dave, you seem skeptical. Why would you be long? Well, because I had some setups and I took them. And I'm also in trend following mode on some of that bit that have been on for a while. All right, individual stocks. Let's get this start taking taking a look at those. Zach wants to know, would Erie be considered a deacceleration in trend? That's a good question. And I like that. Eric? Oh, Erie, I was about to say. I'm going to kick you out of the group for asking you about electrocardiogram. <laughs> um, it's not a blatant deceleration of trend. I hear you. A um, couple things. The HV is a little light on this one, and something bad could always happen. So given the price of the stock, you would probably have to put on quite a few shares to capture a move in volatility, which would expose a lot of your account. And this is something, Zach, we were talking about last week at the Q&A. It could be priced for perfection. Um, I hear what you're saying because it went up like this, and then it kind of went over like that as far as deceleration. But... It doesn't jump out at me as being horribly, like a horrible deceleration of trend. That's one that I can't think of right now. If one of you guys, maybe we'll get lucky and somebody will ask about it. But it's a pullback that I don't like because it did just that. It decelerated in its trend. So, no, I think it looks okay. I think it needs more of a knockout. But I also think it's too low in volatility to trade. Plan, P-L-A-N. Um, this looks okay. This is on my momentum list that I've been building, that I'm always building, I should say. And every now and then I clean it up. But this one has made the cut so far. It's had a fairly nice breakout higher, fairly nice follow through. So, yeah, if it pulls back, it could set up and be worth a shot on that one. Good eye. Congratulations. NVCR. Yeah, this, this is another pretty good looking stock. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Um, I prefer if it wasn't coming off of this wild and crazy move, okay? Something like, and I know it's in perfect hindsight, but like back here, it broke out of the base, had some pullbacks along the way. That looks a little bit more interesting than coming out of this wide and loose move and then Longer term, it could be priced for perfection. So I think I would try to find something a little bit more cleaner longer term than that, okay? CTVA, is that Carvana? No, CTVA, okay. Well, this one's starting to get a little interesting in here. It had a fairly tight range for an IPO, but now it's beginning to break out. Let's just take a look at where the five-day moving average would be, if I could find it. Okay. So if you were trading the IPO Landry Light system, the trigger would have been yesterday. I found the range was a little tight on this one. And that's why I didn't get too excited about it. You had a gap above the moving average, or I should just say Landry Light, okay? And then you had a new closing high. So I would wait for the next pullback here. Anybody know what they do? But, yeah, good eye on that one. That one definitely needs to be on your watch list. I can tell you guys are getting smarter and smarter. The stock picks are getting much better. All right, IRT. As a general statement, I'm not a big fan of REITs. 
You got an HV of 18. That's a little bit on the low side. I hear you though. It's broken out. It's pulled back. If the HV was, if the HV were a little higher, I'd say yeah, it might be worth a shot. But I'm going to give that one a not bad. If you felt like you had to take a trade, you could certainly do a lot worse than that. I like the way it's first pull back out to base breakout. That's a good pattern to trade. But you're not going to get a high five on that one because the HV is a little bit on the low side. Jesse, that is the pick I was teasing about, so I need to think about whether or not I'm going to cover that. Now, here's another REIT. This one's a little bit more higher in volatility, so if I had to pick between those two REITs, I kind of like this one better because a little higher in volatility, a little bit more excitement to it, a little bit sharper breakout. I like this deep retracement. But obviously, if it retraces much more, all bets are off. So that one's okay. But if I had to pick between the two, I would pick that one. I'll come back to that, Jesse. You need to think about that. I, I might give it to you guys. EVBG. <laughs> if I talk about that one, then I'll be forced to take it. So this could be one of those price for perfection type of things. It's had about a 500% run as far as this chart goes back. That's super duper high levels. It sort of had a little breakout in here. It's almost pulled back to the breakout. I'm going to say it looks okay. But I try to find something that's in the earlier phases of a run up. Okay. GT for Mr. Phil. Let me guess. It's going to be a pullback to the 50 day moving average. Where's the 50 day moving average? No, nope, not yet. Um, this is, I'm guessing a short. On the short side, especially with the market at high levels, I prefer finding stocks that are at high levels and in the early phases of rolling over and breaking down as opposed to those, as opposed to those at low levels. All right, Mike wants to know about ZYXI. ZYXI. Well, the problem here is you've got a gap down today, okay? So usually after a big gap like this, and why my gap program didn't catch that? Good eye. My gap program should have caught that. I might have got sucked into a bad trade, though. Maybe I'm lucky I didn't. <laughs> but interesting that it did have this big gap down. The fact that it made this huge gap here, I would go ahead and ignore it. If this bar was a little higher up, I would consider that a nice little knockout move, and I think it'd be worth a shot. But, yeah, unless you were planning a, a day trade on this one, I would stay away. Just for S&Gs, let's take a look at the day trade. I don't think I would take it, but let's just – Take a look at that and see. Yeah, so it's kind of crazy in the first bar. So yeah, if it, yeah, it's just too, it's too crazy. So yeah, your day trade would be if it took out 950 on its way back to fill that gap, but I think I'd avoid that, even on a day trade. What do you think about ENPH? ENPH. Yeah, it looks okay. Um, let's see what we have longer term. It's a little bit extended, or a lot of it extended, like I said earlier, so it's ran up 2,000% and change. So I would maybe try to find something that's a little bit lower levels and just getting started. But it looks okay, it's not bad. I mean, you certainly would do worse. It certainly can't beat you up for that. Okay, yeah, uh, several, a lot of you guys asked about EMPH. Okay, good eyes. All right, uh, Z-I-O-P, we talked about that one yet.